All right, welcome again, ladies and gentlemen, to the philosophy of art and science. Today, I am joined by my beloved younger cousin and brother, Yosia Samson Getacho, and he could take it a lot further for you than that. And Devin Nahli. Denag Zavri Meskan, Adlin, Anten Devin Nahli. Denag Zavri Meskan. I'm so glad that we were able to do this. I Every time I, I talk to this young man, I say, man, I don't talk to this young man enough, so I need to start pestering him on the phone. But I said, you know what? I need to stop being gub gaba. I need to stop being greedy, and I need to, to share this young man with the world. So we're going to talk <laughs> about uh, a bunch of ideas that are kind of themes of my show. So from the title of the show, you know, philosophy for me, it means wisdom, love, or the love of wisdom. And it, it, it for me, can, you know, be used pejoratively by some people. For me, I think it just, I relate the idea of thinking critically. For me, I like to th think critically. I like to make sure that my theory is not divorced from practice. And then I like to tinker. I'm always tinkering with everything I do. So anyway, one of the common themes of this show is the categories of education. And two, those two big categories are in the title of the show itself, science and art, or as it's known in the universities, usually STEM and humanities. We have this third category called social sciences. We'll put it aside for now. This is actually what I studied in my major, but uh, I'm, I'm less interested in it now in a, in a direct sense. In, in other senses, I'm still interested. But the, the art is up for creatives and the STEM or the science are for those who are more object oriented. and and those types of thinkers. But I think the rare individual, and I hope uh, I'm able to make a black man blush this evening, the rare individual is able to do both of those things. I've seen in your life, your, through your engineering, through your study of Amharic as someone born and raised in the United States, and through your study of the Holy Scriptures, someone who's used both sides of his brain, the left side and the right side. So, I mean, we, we could begin maybe with the, the engineering and, and as we kind of uh, weave through it naturally, we can, we can get to Amharic and, and to the Bible. But how, how did you get into engineering and what, what type of engineering did you get into? Yeah, so everybody get yourself a cousin like Henoko will hype you up. Um, so yeah, no, thank you for that. Um, how did I get into engineering? So this is one of those things where now you're concerned because stuff's being recorded and you're like, who's going to see this? <laughs> <laughs> engineering, if I'm being completely honest, it started with, I mean, as a classic Abisha, right? Uh, I had only two real options um, in my family. We did, lawyers was not an option. So it was like, be a doctor, be an engineer was how I was raised. And growing up, that I'm really driven by efficiency, like very much like I want to do, make the best decision with the least amount of cost to me and all of that. And so I remember when I was a freshman in high school, I was in this like, you know, early like career planning, one of those classes, it was called ACE, Academic Career Excellence. And they were basically, okay, plan out the rest of your high school classes. And then, you know, think about where you want to go to college and what you want to be when you grow up. And so, we had an essay that was assigned, what do you want to do when you're older? And I wrote that I want to be a dentist because I was like, yo, dentists get paid. I've also never seen a dentist do work. Every time I go into the office, the hygienist does everything. Then the dentist comes in at the end and goes, you look good, you look good. And uh, they work their own hours and it seemed like a good life to me. And I was like, you know, four more years of school, get to set your own hours, seems like you can make a lot of money, makes sense. As I got older though, between then and uh, when I graduated from high school, I was really like, yo, four more years of school is actually a really long time. Um, and then the whole having to start your own practice, all that stuff, it, it lost its luster for me. And by my junior, senior years, okay, um, it's serious now, like I gotta pick what I'm gonna do. And I'd always been good at math and science and just like, praise God, I just, I was talented at that. And okay, what do people who are good at math and science do? Apparently it's engineering. And so I started looking into it and I had actually the wonderful blessing that both my youth leaders from church were electrical engineers. 
And so in high school, I got to shadow one of them at work for a week and work on a little mini project there, um, just like a lab. And I was like, cool, like I can see myself doing this. Like I, I'm interested in it, it works. Um, and it's a very long and wonderful story of like how God worked that out for me. Um, that place where I uh, shadowed my old youth leader, I ended up getting a internship miraculously the next summer. Um, and then kept coming back every year after that. And then now I'm working there full time. So it started sort of from the, ah, I don't want to work that hard to make money to now, okay, like I see this um, really more as a opportunity to do something that I enjoy while funding the life that I want to live. Like it opens the door for me to do things I wouldn't be able to do otherwise. So I'm a youth leader at uh, one of the churches that I go to and I'm volunteer, like I'm not on staff there and being able to work at an engineering company, full-time salary allows me to, you know, volunteer my time and I'm free on Sundays because the office is closed. So uh, yeah, it works out pretty well. That's beautiful. So I think the two things that, that I heard there, and we're going to go back and explore some of it, is one that, you know, you're kind of guided, let's say, gently pushed <laughs> from, uh, from family to get into this field. But you're very thankful and grateful that that happened. And it happened to align naturally with some things you were naturally talented at. And that lets you do something perhaps that you have maybe equal passion, if not more passion for, without having to worry about having your opinions or your judgments muddied by the, the trappings that come along with ministry and money. I think uh, yeah. versions of the Bible say mammon might enter the picture. <laughs> and, and so that's, that's great. And it, it just seems providential that you've been at the, the same kind of company in many different iterations of yourself at, at different ages. Yeah. And um, one, of, one of the things that we kind of skipped over is the, the education part. I remember seeing this meme one time of these Habashas on Twitter who were talking about what's the only thing better than for your Habasha parents to see you get into Harvard, and that is getting into Harvard twice. Now, <laughs> arguably, 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 an equal institution, if not a close second to that, is a, a little place in Palo Alto that some folks may or may not have heard of, known as Stanford University. And you were not only educated there once, but twice. Can you can you tell us a little bit about that that experience? You know how you were studying engineering there. And then, you know, what, if any, differences did you see originally growing up in L.A.? I don't know if you remember because you were a kid back then. I do, I do, I do. He said play uh, with Donkey Kong and Mario. And then, On the Nintendo 64, I remember, yeah, you and Donkey exactly. So L.A., <laughs> Austin, uh, we could say Palo Alto or the, the San Francisco Bay Area, you know, you could talk about any sort of cultural differences, if there were any shocks, if there were any things you noticed and how you were able to kind of blend in in that environment while still, you know, focusing on the, the engineering that we were just discussing. And there was also a unique program, not totally unique, but something that few universities, I think, in the United States have, an Amharic program that you enlisted in. So you could tell, talk to us about that as well. Yeah, yeah. So that's sort of a lot. I'll try to remember it and just talk about I got you if not I got you if not yeah thank you so college Stanford yeah um it was a wonderful blessing like it I was applying to schools my senior year and it, it's funny because sort of and I think you'll appreciate this like you know as a child you sort of just have it's life is simpler and although I was 17 I, I think it was still pretty simple in a way where when I started applying to schools, I mean, I had done really well in high school. And so I thought, okay, I can shoot for the moon. And I just looked up electrical engineering, best programs. 
and I applied to <laughs> school one, school two, <laughs> and then I'm like, oh, and school, I applied to one, two, and three on that list. And then I was like, okay, well, if I don't get into any of those three, then it'd be cool to go to school in California. I still have family there. I love the weather. Um, so I also applied to USC. And then my dad was like, are you going to apply to any schools in Texas? <laughs> And so, yeah, I also applied to UT, um, which also is like a top 10 electrical engineering program. UT Austin, right? UT Austin. UT Austin, yeah. My family is uh, in a suburb, like maybe 25 miles from downtown. So it would have been a close, uh, a very different experience than what I had, but it would have been close by and still a great school. And when I got accepted to Stanford, it was like, wow, that's amazing. Like, cool. But what are we going to do financially, right? Like Stanford is very expensive. Um, it's a private school. How's it going to work out? My parents um, had always told me, like, you're going to have to figure out how you're going to pay for school. Like, th this is not something we're really going to be able to help you with growing up. That's one of the reasons that, like, you have to study because you have to make sure that your school gets paid for. Um, but fortunately, it wasn't even about, like, merit at that point. Stanford had a very generous financial aid package. And I was like, cool. It actually was going to be cheaper to go to Stanford than UT. So I was like, this is a no brainer at this point. And I got to enjoy the weather get in and out and the door got open and I was like, cool, I'm going to take it. And so, yeah, I think just a quick aside about education though, I thought I was smart when I was in high school. It was definitely something that I, would have prided myself on like, yeah, I'm an intelligent person, whatever. But I didn't know how much I didn't know. And I remember my first test in college, it was math. And I, pff, math, I'm good at math, right? That's why I'm an engineer. Like I applied, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'd been following along in, in class, did pretty well on the homeworks. And I was like, didn't even really study for it. I was like, I looked at my homeworks again. I was like, I'm, I'm good. And that first midterm, I open up the, <laughs> they're like, you know, ding, you, you may start. I'm like, Lord, help me. Open up the, the first page. I'm like, hmm, not really sure how to do this problem. Open up the second page. Not really sure how to do this one either. I get to page nine before I start this. Um, and at that point, I'm like, oh, this is going to be tough. And I did the best that I could. Partial credit came through, but I think I got a 55 out of 96 on that exam. And I was uh, surprised to say the least when I got that score back. And I was like, well, it's been a great few weeks here. You know, no, like my parents didn't go to college, right? They didn't tell me about how this kind of stuff could happen. I, I just thought it was over. I was like, oh, man, I'm not going to cut it. I, I guess I'm not going to make it. And then fortunately, a little bit after that, you know, the curve comes out and they show you, oh, you know, this is where you place and all that. And I was like, oh, wait, I'm not failing. This is good. For um, those who don't know, explain to them what a curve is, because I, I thought it was one of the, the funniest things. And in law school, I actually got one of the weirder curves because um, my degree was different than the other people's degrees. So everybody else in my class was on a curve except me and sometimes one or two other people. Yeah. Okay, so I mean, I don't know if this, I'm not going to speak for Stanford and this being every class, but in this particular class and many of the classes that I took, it would basically be normalized to the average. And the average score on that test would correspond to whatever the teacher decided, usually a B, maybe a B plus. And then, you know, they do their standard deviations and other statistical analysis to decide, okay, well, if you get one standard deviation above the mean, then you're going to get an A minus equivalent. And then two is like an A or what, what, however they work that out. And so that test, I think I did about average. And so I was like, oh, I can recover from this. This is okay. At this point, I'm still under the impression that I'm only allowed to get A's. And so I'm like, okay, I can find a way to figure this out. But it definitely was a wake up call for me to see, oh, school is going to require more effort than I thought. And yeah, that went and uh, I learned a lot of things through that, but it was not going to just be, I'm just going to show up to college and make it all work. Um, 
So yeah, it, it was good. I think it, it taught me a lot of things. It definitely humbled me and that helped <laughs> in a lot of different areas of my life uh, because school had been something I identified so strongly with and recognizing, oh, whoa, like it's not going to be the same like it used to be. That was really good for me. But you mentioned Amharic and I actually was late to the Amarina train because they offered one year of Amharic. So Amharic, like, you know, we, we were on the quarter system. So Amharic one, two, and three would be offered fall quarter, winter quarter, and spring quarter. And I didn't hear about the class till spring quarter. And so I took it, Amharic, the, the last Amharic, the highest Amharic that they offered, uh, which was just beginner Amharic, like the equivalent of semester three, but in our quarter three. And it was a wonderful experience, man. Like I thoroughly enjoyed that class. There was, I think six or seven of us. Um, That's a small class. Huh? That's a small class. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, in that, I think everybody was of some Ethiopian Eritrean descent um, combination of that, except for I think one student because she was dating another one who was in the class and his family was Ethiopian and they were in a pretty serious relationship. And so she wanted to learn the language. And she would actually do better than him, so it was really funny. Uh, <laughs> yeah, she she would just get like almost perfect scores on everything. He'd miss like one, and she'd be like, "Look, I'm better than you." It was really funny. My better than the bed. Yeah, our our professor uh, Isaias, Professor Isaias, um, he was awesome, and it was really nice to be able to speak in Amharic in college because. I know a lot of parents fear like, oh, you know, our kids are going to forget the language or whatever. It was definitely something that I thought about a little bit. Like, well, if I'm not speaking with anybody, I mean, I call home occasionally, but it was great. In English? When you call home, was it in English, Amharic, bilingual? No, Amharic, that's what I'm saying. I would try to, I would speak in Amharic with my family uh, for the most, definitely with my mom, on my, with my dad. We somehow devolve into English sometimes. And so we have to sort of like, hey, no, I need to practice Amharic. But that class, it was, it was a four unit class. And so we met twice a week for two hours and to just be able to sit and immerse yourself. It was so nice. It was pretty basic. I, there were the, the focus of the class was to teach non-native, you know, people learning from scratch. Right. And so more, I, conver more conversation or writing and conversation. Uh, it was more writing and reading uh, some, it, there definitely was a spoken component, but it wasn't, like he was conducting the class in Amharic and, you know, we're like, it wasn't like conversational Amharic or anything like that. So we, I learned a lot though, because there were things that I never did, like conjugating verbs, you know, like that was not something that uh, I would go through all the different tenses and things. It's sort of something that I had on instinct, but I realized my instinct was wrong in certain cases. And so it, it was good. Uh, my Amharic definitely improved that quarter. My mother noticed a huge difference. Like I said, it was spring quarter. And so I went home for summer after that, and my mom was like, wow, like, this class has been really good for you. And so I really enjoyed that. It was nice to have a little slice of home uh, in college. Nice. And and Kazaba Fitana Bnebber, Ways Yanni No, Kazaba Fitana Bnebber, Fidelia Tamarkut, I think Sabatina Kafalone, when I'm Sematina Kafalone, and I Tamarkut. So you're just in it to get an A, huh? Oh, for sure. But like I said, I learned things. It was, yeah, my highest grade that semester, I will say, <laughs> um, that quarter. And it was fun. It was a class that I thoroughly enjoyed. I really did think was useful for me, even though I quote unquote knew some of the stuff. It was very beneficial for me. And uh, yeah, it was good to practice the reading too. Like just having something in front of you every time I had homework to just go back through and read, it was, it was, it was really good. I appreciate that. There have been uh, many people in history. They used to have this term man of letters, you know, to refer to scholars. And I really like that that title. I try to use it myself. And one of the thing that's common about people who were men of letters, you know, for for example, Samuel Johnson and H.L. Mencken, to give a British example and an American example, is that they were people who wrote dictionaries people who studied other people's attempts at making dictionaries. And I've had times in my life where when I was a child, we had physical print 
dictionaries and encyclopedias. And, you know, my dad, whenever I ask him a question, he say, did you look it up in the dictionary? Did you look it up in the encyclopedia? If my answer to either of those questions was no, then he would not answer anything. And I have to go, you know, search and, and peruse those things. And I've done the same in Amharic and now more recently with Giz. And some people try to point to that and think that it's it's somehow an inauthentic component of learning. But if you examine anybody who's ever been super scholarly, like they're not by themselves. If we're by ourselves, we would have stayed, you know, cavemen. We've never progressed to have the tools that I'm sure you use in, in your job every day. And so it's this willingness to, to be intentional, like you said, to have whatever talent, you know, that may be God given that you have or biological, and then add to it the kind of the the effort you put in to the to the engineering study and the Mark study. Now it's funny because you and I, the way we grew, I, I very much relate to what you said in terms of we didn't learn Amharic formally. We learned it by by hearing our family members speak it. And we turned out to be uh, some of the better uh, Ethiopian Americans who are able to to speak Amharic and then, you know, at later dates, uh, read and write. And I was excited when when you learned how to read and write because then we both had this thing, uh, you know, my sisters don't really read and write. They might know their name and a few other things, but it 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 takes a certain level of of effort in addition to the talent you have, a certain amount of grit to be made fun of. You know, I don't know about you, but for me, I couldn't roll my R's till I was 19. I was illiterate till 21. Um, obviously not in English, but in Amharic. And so it, it's it's developmental and it it ranges so many different identities, like we've talked about, right? Um, I, I couched it in terms of for you being a STEM student and a humanities student, because you didn't have to take Amharic. You could have taken like Spanish or French or whatever it is that you took in, in, in high school. And who knows, you know, um, maybe Amharic was easier, but the fact that you humbled yourself to say, even though I know what I know, I know how to read, I know how to speak, you humbled yourself and kind of submitted to the kind of grammar and the nitty gritty details that, that, um, that you can only get when learning in a, in a formal setting, really, to be honest, it made you more polished. And reading has definitely helped me over the past eight, nine years or so as well in, in Amharic. Another, I think, interesting experience, um, and I think you would have a great hot take on it. Definitely don't say uh, anything that you, that you uh, don't feel comfortable. But I remember when I visited you, you were in, in some sort of, uh, and you would have better terminology for this, but black living experience. And we've seen kind of various issues and, and takes on, on identity, identity politics, and, and things like that across different perspectives. But I guess what I'm more interested in is like, you know, you're a Christian, you're a man of God, a follower of Christ. The way you conduct yourself is is different. What, what sort of value did you find in, in the black living experience in, in Stanford? And what if, what if anything do you draw, you know, based off of the experiences you had now and, and some of the, the civil unrest that, that we see in our country that is likely only going to get worse as the election approaches? Yeah, so I lived in Ujima house, uh, and like Ujima, ooh, Ujima, say what? That was one of our chants, and it was a wonderful experience, man. Like I, it was so that was my junior year. I had the wonderful uh, privilege to be able to live there. Um, it was it's a pretty sought after place to live, and my lottery number just happened to work out, and it it was great. So I think with anything, whether it's, and, and the theme of the house is basically for, to celebrate and learn more about people of the African diaspora. So wide ranging, we, this is gonna be things that we talk about. We had weekly theme talks. I'm forgetting some of the terminology now, but uh, you know, someone would present every week about a topic. And- Mandatory or voluntary? It, for the people who like there was a people who lived there because they just happened to get in like the lottery system. And that was very few people who did that. Um, but then people who like, because it had like a, it was a theme dorm. So people could apply because they wanted that experience. And so as part of that, you were signing up to say one week out of the school year or whatever, I'm going to uh, give a presentation um, in line with the, the topic, the theme. And so it's the, the actual residents are giving the presentations? 
Yeah, yeah exactly. Like students, um, you know, whatever age range they are, like they could be uh, sophomores, juniors, or seniors who are giving the presentations. And uh, yes, so they would speak on a topic and they get to pick it, but it's somehow related to the African diaspora. And I really did enjoy my time there. I think for me, I was a little apprehensive at the beginning, just, you know, as an Ethiopian American, and I've heard you talk about this before, and it's a common experience, I think, for a lot of immigrant children or immigrant, like the children of immigrants who it, especially coming from Ethiopia, right? Where, and I've heard you talk about this, you know, we're not uh, the descendants of slaves. So like my family, my parents both immigrated from Ethiopia in the eighties. And so that's my family line is all in Ethiopia. And I have seen throughout life, not even just in college, but it got more crystallized, I think a little bit in college because it was from more intelligent people or the way they articulated it was more intelligent, but it's like you, it's different, right? You know, if you're talking about some issue our perspective is going to be different than the perspective of somebody whose family has been here for hundreds of years. And the, sometimes that's like fine. And sometimes that is not because we're going to say something that maybe somebody else doesn't want to hear. And they're going to put down that perspective by saying, ah, but you don't actually know. And on the flip side, but from, you know, the more Caucasian white, European American side of it, it's like, well, you're still in that, you know, very generally speaking, right? You're still in that black category. They can't tell most of the time by looking yeah. at us. Those those who are more, um, I don't know if discreet is the right word, distinguishing, discriminating. I don't know what the right word yeah. is, but those those who know can kind of yes. tell a difference. And it, you know, it varies amongst various black folks too. I've had some black folks who go, you Ethiopian, you Eritrean off the bat, you know, whereas others yeah. are like, are you part Arab? Are you part Hispanic? You know, where they don't really know yeah. what it is. Um, so yeah, some people are able to tell by facial features, some not, some it's blanket, you know, y'all look the same type of uh, thing, but yeah. And, and so some of us are experiencing the same things because we may appear, for example, to the police in the same way, but you're saying that some of our perspectives and, and lenses may be different on any given subject. Yeah, and I think for the first time in my life, I was surrounded by people who were very pro-black, right? Um, in a lot of beautiful ways, right? Like, and I think that was, that's an experience in and of itself. It's sort of like when people talk about going back to Ethiopia or some other place, uh, some other country in Africa, they're like, I've never been, I've never seen so many black people. And, you know, it's, it's a different experience to be the majority. And that was really cool in many ways. And I, I think though that nuance is lost a lot in our culture today. And so one of the, wonderful benefits I think of being the child of Ethiopian immigrants is that I can see and growing up here in America is, but even though I grew up here in America, I grew up going to an Ethiopian church. I grew up with parents who spoke Amharic in the house. Like it was a very culturally Ethiopian upbringing. And being fed by Injera. Exactly, exactly. Grew up on Kutfo and Tufs and yeah, Misr, Shiro, all that, right? And in that context, I'm able to see, or what I believe to be the pros and cons of our culture as Ethiopians and the pros and cons of American culture. I think one of the best examples of this is I wasn't raised with deep American political ideology. Whereas a lot of Americans, black, white, Hispanic, any, anybody, if they're Americans and their family has been here for a while, are sort of maybe this is the wrong word, but indoctrinated by their families, right? Like, I, think that, I think that's the right word. And I'll, and I'll get to it as soon as you're done, I'll get to why I think it is. And so either the, the children take from their parents and agree and sort of walk in step with that, or they react to what their parents did. And so they choose the opposite. But either way, it's sort of formed by their family upbringing. 
because my parents were Ethiopian and they're, you know, they're not Republican or Democrat or libertarian or, and you know, like that's not something that is part of their DNA. They never brought me up on that. And so I got to make all those decisions, looking at what I think is good and looking what I think is bad. And so in the same way, I think living in Ujima, it was like, oh, so this is what the other side is like. I've lived in very uh, predominantly white places. Like my family, like I said, lives in Leander. I went to school in Leander and not that many black people. <laughs> and so much of what I grew up in was, this is the society's idea of what good looks like. And this is the idea of what black looks like. And usually they're not the same. And I'd hear things like, oh, but you're too smart to be black. Or, you know, things like, you know, things like that where it wasn't even always like outright malicious. It it was just the culture a lot of times for certain people. And then certain people, yeah, they're just outright, you know, not cool. The, 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 the kind of academic culture refers to it as a microaggression. And yes, um, exactly. the basic theory being a paper cut doesn't hurt. But if you encounter a thousand paper cuts a month, you start asking <clears throat> questions why you keep getting cut. Yeah. And so this was my first experience not getting paper cuts at all, right? Like in, inside the living situation, just like, whoa, things are. And so my sort of response was sometimes like, whoa, are we too pro-black? Like, this is a <laughs> and, and I think in, in fairness and in honesty, I think there were times where I wouldn't have responded the way they did to certain things. They meaning certain individuals I'm thinking of in my head. Um, but overall, I think it was good. Like one example I can think of was uh, Richard Sherman. And this was back when Richard Sherman was with the Seahawks. This is a few years ago, back when I was in school, the Seahawks went up against, I think, the 49ers in a uh, NFC or the AFC. It was one of the championship games, before the game before the Super Bowl. I forget which conference they're in. And the last play of the game, the 49ers have the ball. Richard Sherman's on defense. Uh, he went to Stanford, by the way, so that's sort of how it ties in. And he's a play corner, and the 49ers quarterback throws uh, the ball to Michael Crabtree, who is a 49ers receiver. Richard Sherman makes a, a play on the ball, sort of deflects it, and game over, Seahawks win, going to the Super Bowl. Reporter comes up to Richard Sherman, like, moments after the game is over, like, how do you feel about that play? Like, how do you feel about, you know, helping your team make it to the Super Bowl? He's like, man, that's what happens when you put up a sorry receiver up against me. I'm the best. Like, Michael Crabtree, he's sorry. Like, and so, you know, that, that whole thing happens. And some commentators are like, man, this, this dude Sherman acting like an ape. And it's like, whoa, like, why are you using that language? Like, whoa, what's going on, right? And so this became a, a point of discussion in, in the house that, that week or a couple of weeks after. And I think in people's desire to defend Richard Sherman against that kind of language, right? Like how, why would someone say that? Like that, that is not coming from a loving place, right? Um, but I think they defended Sherman to the point of he did absolutely nothing wrong. That's like, okay, I'm not trying to judge the guy, but I think it should be fair to say, I wouldn't want my child speaking like that when they have time to think about their answer, right? Let's, I'm not, let's take now the moment and all that out of the equation, but just like, I don't want my child, I don't want to be the kind of person who comes off that arrogantly, right? Like the word says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Like I want to be a humble person. I mean. We should want to be humble people. And so- we should be able to say, yeah, Richard Sherman made a play, great play. That was a great athletic uh, effort. And his team went to the Super Bowl and he had a hand to play in that. And that's awesome. He's a great player. Maybe he shouldn't have said it the way that he said it, but nothing about how he said it justifies that kind of racist language. Like this man's an ape, anything like that. Like that's not cool. And so that commentator has no defense for that. That's incorrect and should apologize and all of that. But that's different than, oh, yeah, like, go Richard Sherman with no caveats, right? So that's just one example I can think of. Um, 
of like, oh, sometimes it's easy to swing to the other side in defense of like, because it's not just about Richard Sherman, right? We're talking about a situation where this kind of thing happens all the time. And it's not fair that a black person making that kind of comment is treated that way versus, you know, a white player who might make a very similar comment is like, wow, his confidence is great. You know, he helps lead his team. Like the, the way that that would be perceived is different. And we are right to respond to that and against that. But we also can't lose sight of, well, still, what should we be doing? So. And they didn't know what the bit talk. <laughs> you know what's so funny is that you and I, without talking about these issues, have come to very similar, if not the same conclusions in different ways. I want to go back to the word you used, indoctrination. I don't think you used it incorrectly. One of my highest rated videos here is surveying Ethiopian history with Curtis Yarvin. He popularized this phrase or this turn of phrase called the cathedral. And the cathedral, it's being used by many different people, it originates with him, is this idea that with the American and French revolutions and with Europe and the United States having, you know, the people who are of the enlightenment, of this kind of deism where they believe in God, but he doesn't really intervene in the world and sort of slowly abandoning Christianity. People like Thomas Jefferson having a Bible, but then he rips out everything that he thinks is miraculous. And he says, this is what I'm keeping from the Bible. You know, you have a Thomas Jefferson Bible. You have people like Abraham Lincoln, you know, quoting from the KJV profusely, whether or not he actually believes in it, you know, is a, is a separate story that could be examined. Why I bring this up is the kind of academic institutions the fourth estate or the fourth branch as it's called, meaning the, the corporate media um, as, as decentralized as all of these institutions are, it seems that a lot of people in the major kind of parties, especially to an extent, you know, in, in the Democratic Party more and more, but in, in both parties, you see that they end up agreeing on all of the important matters, which is why I'm so glad you said you were, you were not raised in a politically ideological way. And what I think makes your point of view so different is that you firmly, and we've talked about this before, you know, uh, just you and I, you firmly have this conviction. I, I don't know, there, there's no polite way to say it, right? But everyone is obsessed nowadays with how people self-identify. Self-identifying as a Christian is not even a standard that is borne out in the Bible. He says in Matthew 7, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter my kingdom. And so we know that lip service, as we see in Isaiah, is not a guarantee that you are a Christian. Just because you self-describe as Christian doesn't make you one. But someone who's a genuine convicted Christian who is pursuing the worldview as it's found in, in Scripture is going to have Jesus not only on Sundays at 10 a.m. to 11 a.m., but as the lens through which they see every single issue, whether it be your engineering, whether it be your education, whether it be you know your study of the scriptures itself, your study of Amharic, your analyzation, uh, your analyzing of, of political issues, of, of how sports and, and politics intersect, you're coming at it with a worldview that is formed by scripture because you've said that that is gonna be the thing that guides your life. I'm gonna bet good money that not everybody who was in your living situation had exactly that point of view. And, yeah, and, and to the extent, to the extent that you do, I, I would really question the numbers because that's gotta be a, a, a minority. And so I think you're right. And what people would do is they would call it victim blaming. They would go down to even, for example, the songs of one of the songs Frank Ocean did with Kanye West and uh, you know prior to his more recent uh, reconverting. And, and Jay-Z, who's definitely antithetical to, to Jesus and has many lyrics that has said, you know, Jesus cannot save you and life starts when the church ends, things like that. But in some of the lyrics that they push is that there is no idea of good and evil. And so it's all about reaction and it's all about having this secular lens and frame. And from a secular lens and, and point of view, being braggadocious or arrogant is not a vice. It's only a vice, not according to that philosophy, but to the Bible. And so because you had that as your, your kind of your North Star, that, that which is guiding you, you were able to critique the victim in this situation 
as uh, who's Sherman, as well as the commentator. And so you you have this double-edged sword, which is the Bible with you, as we hear in Hebrews, which is able to say, yes, racism is wrong, but the the form of you know anti-racism in this particular category does not permit you know any sort of thing that would be considered uh, a vice in the Bible. And it, you know, it's like it's it's so interesting to me. I, I don't know if I could push you to, to talk about it. You, you'll you'll let me know. But one of the, the funniest stories you told me of kind of living out this life of of scripture and prov providing a different worldview is you see there's the Westboro Baptist kind of version of Christianity where you're yelling and trying to cause tell someone they're damned. And in many universities, you'll see, you know, some older person typically or someone who's got a cross or a sign and, um, you know, they're <laughs> a fire and brimstone and and they're singing damnation. I remember you told me a story one time about, I think it was a fraternity row or a sorority row, uh, row, and you were out there just cooking pancakes and handing out free pancakes to people. And you would only engage people in discussion if they wanted to. But if all they wanted was pancakes, you're like, cool, that's it, you know, and no fire and brimstone. Can you, can you tell us a little bit about kind of that yeah. project and the idea so, of that? Hey, I, I did not come up with that. Yeah, so I was, had the wonderful privilege to be part of Chi Alpha at Stanford University. And just a quick thing, Chi Alpha is not a fraternity. It is the New Testament was written, most of it was written in Greek. The first letter of Christ in Greek is Chi. The first letter of ambassador is Alpha. So the name is just Christ Ambassadors. It comes from 2 Corinthians 5.20. But so we had men and women in our group. It was a wonderful organization. Shout out to Glenn Davis, Paula, and everybody on staff there. Y'all had been, y'all were used by God to change my life. And I am so thankful to this day for all that God did um, through your ministry and uh, at Stanford. So that particular ministry is called uh, Pancakes. <laughs> and it actually started with um, an older student who, he was uh, a senior when I was a freshman. He went down to Santa Barbara because um, he heard about a ministry down there and he was just hanging out with some of his friends. And at UC Santa Barbara, I believe, there's this uh, ministry called Jesus Burgers. And so they like make burgers outside at night, um, like, you know, Friday night, Saturday night, like a night where there's a bunch of people out and about going to parties, going around, right? And they would serve it to people. And so he saw that and it's like, yo, that's cool. Like we should do something like that here, but you know, permits like with food and stuff like that. It's like, you know, you can't just be cooking meat for people. Um, and there'd be a large percentage of people who wouldn't eat that meat. So we're trying to serve people well. Pancakes, everybody likes pancakes, right? Pretty, you know, it, it worked out pretty well as a widely desired food. And so our thought was, we're gonna set up, um, we, we, I think we got out there usually like 10 or 11 p.m. and we would gather first, we'd pray um, and just ask God like, Lord, like help us serve our campus well tonight. You know, we just want people to see that you are good. Whatever else they may hear or know about Christianity, like you, Jesus, are good and we want them to see that. And so we'd go and we just make pancakes, right? We have griddles out there. We got toppings and <laughs> it, it started becoming a cool thing. Cause like we wouldn't really announce it. We would just do them. And it may be like a day or two before uh, some people like in the ministry would know about it. Right. And then, you know, they might tell a couple people, but it was just sort of like a surprise thing for the most part. It's a pop-up shop. Exactly. And we would just set up in the middle of campus. So, I mean, if you know where uh, anything about Stanford campus, it's, we would sometimes set up on the row, but that was a, a little bit more rare. We'd have to get permission from somebody. Um, but we would sometimes set up in the middle of campus where people would be walking, sort of like a central area where people would pass through to get to the row, which is where a lot of the parties were happening. And so we just plug into outlets, start making pancakes, and we would just have them on tables, just ready for people to come uh, and pick them up, right? We'd have toppings. Uh, sometimes we'd have water. And people would be like, yo, why are y'all doing this? <laughs> and that's our opening, right? Like, hey, we're doing this because we believe Jesus loves you. And we want to show you that through a pancake. And <laughs> we're more than happy, right? We would love to engage in a deeper conversation about that. Um, but we're not out there trying to shame anyone or anything like that, right? Like you're talking about, you see these quote unquote Christians out here with signs, Um just really speaking what 
to everyone listening sounds like hate, right? And, you know, the Bible talks about uh, in Ephesians 4, you know, speaking the truth in love. And there, we have a responsibility as Christians to speak truth in a loving way. Um, it is not good enough to say, oh, we spoke truth and the person not receiving it, it doesn't matter. It's like we have a responsibility to the extent that is allowed and godly to package that truth in a way that a person can receive. And so we did that with pancakes and people like, oh, can I have another one? And I'm like, look, Jesus came that we may have life abundantly. And that means you can have more than one pancake. So we were just having a good time. <laughs> oh, man. It was just fun and a wonderful opportunity for us. Like we got so much out of it as people uh, who were making the pancakes and serving just to be able to love our friends well, you know? And sometimes you see people you knew like, oh, hey, what's up, bro? Like come through, get a pancake. They're like, word, yeah. And um, it'd be cool because, you know, sometimes people might be too drunk to remember, but sometimes they would remember, right? And uh, especially, you know, if they haven't been drinking or whatever, or if they just didn't get that drunk. And you'd see them in class or whatever. They're like, yo, you made pancakes for me the other night, right? Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. And so it was a ministry that I think bore a lot of uh, fruit for us who were actually doing the serving of the pancakes, but also for hopefully the people who came through and uh, got to have them. Thank you. I, I think it's a really beautiful and creative outreach idea. Like you said, working on the big pictures of, of Christianity. I've had people in, in very combative ways sort of ask me these theological debate questions about some of these social issues in Christianity. And I begin, I always start off, I was like, who's God? You know what I mean? Like these big things, like what does love mean? Who is God? These kind of like basic things. Like some people don't understand God is like separate from the universe. You know, the new age folks have used the universe gave me this, the universe did this, that, and a third for me so much that they think, you know, when we talk about God, we're talking about space and time. And it's like, even that kind of zoomed out view of just beginning, like, no, 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 we're talking about the author of life. You know, we're talking about love. These, these kind of like basic things, I think are so important to drill in because again, everybody assumes America is a Christian country. We understand what Christianity is. We don't need to read the Bible. We've heard about it. We've seen it, da, 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 this, that, and a third. And then they come across a young intelligent man who is getting educated at this university, not once, but twice, and who decides to spend his weekend evening making pancakes for other people. This is what I always describe. This is the, the, the mentality of the early church. The early church invented hospitals for the poor and the sick because back then they only have private doctors for people to go to your house. And so they said, no, this has to go to other people. And other people were like, well, why would you share your property with others? The early church would be fed to lions and would say, we love you. We forgive you. And people are utterly shocked. They're like, what's wrong with these people? When somebody sees a doubly Stanford educated man passing out pancakes in the evening, asking for nothing in return, and he happens to be black and smiling at them too. They're like, what's going on? There's something suspicious. There's something fishy going on. What is behind it? And what ends up being behind it is this, this Christ-centered life. And, and you really have shown us through Nagar Misale, through the parables that you're sharing. I really love the, the Misale or the illustrations you've given us especially the football one to, to feed into the love of sports in the United States and, you know, especially amongst men, but amongst all people. And I, I I'm curious, we've saw, we've seen you also quoting from scripture. So obviously you've been eating the stuff uh, with some regularity. What, what can you tell us of how you've read scripture throughout your life and, and what advice would you have for anyone who just doesn't know where to start? Maybe they started in Genesis and gave up somewhere in Leviticus when they said they were going to read through. Yeah. The struggle. Um, so first of all, I want to say <laughs> that my my example is probably not great, but that God can redeem situations. So first, I mean, in general, my family, I, I didn't miss church ever. Like if we were awake, if we were not, if we were awake, we would be woken up. But if we were alive, we were going to church. Like I seriously, like no exaggeration. I think I have probably missed church like a total of, 
in, while I was in my parents' household growing up, maybe two times while we were in town, right? Like if we were not off on vacation or out somewhere, um, and we were there every Sunday. So part of that is just by being present in Sunday school while people are talking about this thing. Some of that is just being soaked up because, um, like I said, God really has blessed me with, um, I can sort of catch on to things, especially when it's scripture. I'm, I really do remember a lot of it. Um, but I think for me, the journey where I personally started reading the Bible every day. Oh, it's getting sort of dark. Sorry, let me turn on my light. Um, hey, it's a great time to talk about the light as you're talking about your journey. Hey, come on, come on, somebody. <laughs> we got props for y'all. We're using the light as a prop. <laughs> so for me, when I was in uh, middle school, right? Sixth grade, I came uh, into this class and, you know, over the course of the year, there was this uh, very intelligent kid and we started talking about something related to probably some social issue in scripture. I don't even remember what exactly it was, but he said something about the Bible that I didn't believe was true. I was like, no, like that, that, that is a misapplication or something like that. Right? I was like, how would you even know, dude? Like he, he's self-professed atheist, right? It's like, how would you even know, dude? Like that's, it's a Bible. And he goes, I've read it. And I'm like, what do you mean you've read it? You're in sixth grade, the whole thing. And he goes, yeah. I was like, oh, it's like that. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, I will not be outclassed in scripture by an atheist. This cannot happen. So this is why I'm saying this God redeemed this because it was born out of pride. It was coming from a place of like competition. Absolutely not. <laughs> right? Competitive. Like, no, I'm going to go read it. And so I got on one of those Bible reading plans and I was like, I'm going to read this book. Like, and I think it took me two years, I believe. I think I read the New Testament that first year and then the next year I read the Old Testament, if I remember correctly. But that started that daily habit because I'm like, I'm going to do this. I'm going to read it. And over time, it grew from just trying to be competitive. Like that kid moved away. It wasn't just about him. But, oh, no, I, I, I need to know this for myself. And so as far as like, you know, gen starting a Genesis and like stopping Leviticus, like I didn't have that option because I was trying to <laughs> catch up. to <laughs> Because of the competitive um, spirit. Within exactly. I, that wasn't an option. For reference, I'll give you uh, in our adult life when our cousin Jonathan and I were living together, I handed him the the elongated Orthodox uh, version, the Greek Orthodox version. The Ethiopian Orthodox is actually 81 books, uh, you know, the Protestant canon being 66. But I gave him the, I think, 71 book or 72 book, something in that category version. And he went through it in three months. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's it, If you set your mind to it, it's very possible, right? Um and so the, the way that I read scripture, though, was I would read and take notes on what I read. And it was not articulate. It was not that long. It, sometimes it'd be like a, two lines on a regular notebook paper, right? Sometimes it'd be half a page, whatever, right? But what did I get from this? Um, and one of the, and I didn't learn this till I was much older, most of what I did when, at that age was just sort of like, okay, what should I start doing as a result of this was sort of the lens in which I read the Bible. But one of the things I've heard since then, which I think is actually really good is what do I, what should I start believing about God? What should I stop believing about God? That's incorrect from this. What should I start uh doing or stop doing like start believing stop believing for my own like self like about people and my capabilities and all of that and so that i think is a super helpful way to read scripture of course you can read through commentaries there's as much study as one wants to put into it they can put into it and you know some might even say oh jonathan read it in three months how in depth could he have went i think that's the wrong kind of question to be asking it's like feed yourself the word and like allow god because it's the holy spirit that brings revelation you know it's you can make it about, oh, you need to go to a seminary and do this and do that. It's like, no, 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 no. Like, you can meet with God and he can illuminate his scripture to you. Just like allowing that to just feed your soul. And as you talk about it, get into community, discuss it with your 
brothers and sisters and family members and you know like god works in powerful ways and yeah i think that was a big part of my scripture journey through high school and then i got to college and like i said i was involved in chi alpha and i was part of a life group and this was the first time i'd ever been part of a life group where in the past i'd been part of bible studies like my parents were in a bible study so i was sort of in default one and the stated purpose would generally be, okay, we're going to study the scripture. So we'd read a passage and discuss what do we think it means? How do we apply it to our lives, right? Cool. But in life group, the focus was we want to do life together through the lens of scripture. And so a lot of the similar things happen, but one, I think, difference was in how we approached one another. Like, these are our brothers and sisters that we are sharing this with, right? So we would come together and we took it seriously, our catch up time, like, hey, what's been going on in your life? Like that was serious. Like we want to know about what God is doing in each of our lives, how we can be praying for one another. How can we be praising God for what he's been doing in our lives? Um, and we would pray for each other at the end of group. It wasn't just like, oh, well, you know, sweet, like bye, we just pray it out. It's like, Everyone's going to go through if they want and share a prayer request, and we're going to pray for it. Um, and that, I think, was really cool. Um, you know, from that, I think three guys, yeah, Chase, Russell, Stephen Longoria, Alex Gary. I was in three weddings from people that were in my life groups. Like, I was groomsmen yeah. for them. So we were groomsmen for each other and stuff. Um, and so there were some very deep connections that were formed. Um, yeah, that did a lot for me because it went from just studying scripture as something to know intellectually and, you know, believe and grow in to being motivated and pushed to a deeper revelation of who God is because I'm seeing it in my friends' lives. I think uh, I, there's many examples of this, but like one uh, with my friend Chase, I remember what, like we were in a life group together, but we also would occasionally read the Bible together ourselves, like once a week or something like that. And one time I remember we'd gone together one morning and we were just like praying, reading together and the bell rang, like, you know, the bell, whatever. It was like nine o'clock time to go to class. And he goes, man, I wish I could just sit here and like forever, like all day. And I was like, really? Like my heart was like, yes, yeah, about that time. Like I'm gonna go to class now. And <laughs> I recognized like, yo, like he's really trying to get after this. Like there is something to his experience and his desire for God that I can learn from and grow in. Um, and there was a lot of that happening because, you know, we made this conscious effort to try to share our lives together. Um, and so that did a lot for my growth in the word. That's beautiful. So it's like a it's like a deeper connection. It's not just a formality in, in greeting. We had a famous roadway at my undergraduate university, and it was a very small university, only 3,000 people. So you'd often run into the same characters. I think it was a great simulation for me who grew in one of the largest cosmopolitan areas of Los Angeles of a simulation of small town living. I later had you know small town living in North Dakota and in Central Cali, but you, you pass by each other and there's this thing where people go, hi, how are you? And they get so used to it. The repetition is so hard because they're trying to be polite that eventually they start going, hi, how are you? Hi, how are you? How are you? And sometimes they don't even look at you as you're walking by each other. They don't even slow down. Like you see some people will pretend to slow down. Some people will actually stop and say, oh, and get ready for the reception. But I noticed, hi, how are you? was just a replacement for the head nod or for hello. It didn't mean what is your state of being. It meant I'm trying to be polite, get the H out of my way. <laughs> I need to get to where I'm going. I don't have time to see you. We see each other too often on this, on this roadway. So your experience is the exact opposite in terms of building strong, deep connections with one another. And I think it's a great segue to say, some of these close friends had an expectation over the past few months that I also had an expectation. And this is why it's so important, you know, in, in James four and then I believe Proverbs 27 
it says that we don't know about tomorrow. We have to always say God willing or according to the Lord's will whenever we say, oh, I'm going to see you on this day or this day or that and the third. And what happened is you and your beloved wife, Debbie, who I have yet to meet, but I hope to hey. meet soon, uh, were planning to invite us to Austin, Texas, so that all of us could gather and celebrate your your holy matrimony with one another. And uh, Corona or the Rona came and, and spoiled our plans to an extent. But you are now part of this interesting generation who had to make a tough decision. Some people have chosen to delay their their kind of ceremony because they they um, they have various values of you know is it the party itself is it the document from uh, the local Caesar is it uh, the kind of witness of the church community we're a part of there are many different components of a wedding or of marriage or of matrimony whichever word we want to use could you could you walk us through? kind of uh, your experience and, and your decision-making process throughout. And then maybe we'll, we'll, we'll close it out with any advice you have for those who self-identify as Christians and maybe they're on the road or maybe they're not even on the road yet to, to having such a thing in their life. Yeah. So Debbie, yeah, Debbie's awesome. Uh, I love her. And so it was like, why wouldn't I want to get married sooner? So that's the short answer, right? Longer answer is, uh, you know, we had been planning to get married on May 25th. And so it was um, like, a, you know, Memorial Day weekend when everything started picking up with coronavirus, it was like mid-March when it really started, you know, like places like work was closing, things were starting to shut down, lockdowns were going in place. And we, it really came down to the sort of this simple thing, right? We were not living together um, before we got married. Lockdowns were happening. We do not want to be separate from each other. So we, we want to honor the law, right? In the way that I think we should. And, but we also want to be together. And so how can we do both of those things? We can just get married, right? Like um, it, God's providence, you know, we had uh, closed on a house in February. And so there was a home already available. <laughs> and so we talked about it, you know, talked about it with our families and they were cool with it. So we're like, cool, like we're, we're trying to get married. Um, like this was like March 17th, I remember. We talked with, about it with our families. No, not March 17th. Maybe like March 14th, either way, like some, like about a week, like maybe seven to 10 days before we ended up getting married. We're like, okay, cool. Like, uh, no, it was March. Okay. The day doesn't matter either way. Right. Like we, we started talking with our families, like, Hey, you know, we're trying to figure out what to do. Like our roommates were not taking coronavirus as seriously as we would have wanted. And so we're like, you know, this is sort of dangerous just staying here. Like, and so we would like to move into our house, but we want to be married before we do that. Um, is it cool with y'all if we get married? And they said, okay. Um, and then it was like, all right, we're going to get married. March 25th was the plan, like that Friday. But then we heard Austin's lockdown order is going to go into effect midnight on March 24th. So turning into March 25th. And we're like, well, if we would like anybody there at all, right, we would need to get married before then. And so, so that my parents, my, my parents live in Leander, so it was not too far of a drive for them. So they came down and my best man was there. And so we just got married in our living room. Uh, our, uh, the man who's going to officiate our wedding, uh, one of the elders at the church, man who disciples me, Galen Washington, was a wonderful man who's poured a lot into me. Um, him and his wife, uh, Simone, came and they had done our premarital counseling. And so they were there as witnesses. And we got married and it was a very chill ceremony, you know, and we were so thankful we didn't wait. We had a couple friends who had been engaged who were trying to wait it out and see, you know, what's going to go on. And it, you know, like, you, like tomorrow, you, you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, right? And for us to be able to start our marriage and pursue this thing we believe God has called us to do, we're like, why wait? 
so yeah, we got married and it was great. And now we've been married for a few months and it's wonderful because I think we've had this wonderful privilege to be together so much more than an average married couple at this time, right? Because you have to go to work separately, all this stuff. But we spent pretty much 24 seven since uh, we've gotten married and that's been a wonderful blessing. And we're growing and figuring out more of how God uh, is teaching us through the other and relating to one another. And it's been great. I'm very thankful. Um, yeah. What was your other question? <laughs> Thank you. No, that's beautiful. And it, the reason I, I wanted to highlight that is like, it takes a certain amount of faith and vision, as I said, and it, I think, belies certain priorities that you were able to, to do so on, on such a small scale. Of course, it's not a small scale because you have this very big and living God who is there and, and present with you throughout and of course, you know, when we get a chance, when this is all over, we're gonna come visit and, and see that that lovely new home of yours. The other question is kind of, again, going back to this category of folks, like we could just say Christians, but just to be funny, we'll say folks who self-identify as Christians. Some of them may be in the process, maybe boyfriend, girlfriend, maybe in courtship, maybe talking, maybe in a situationship, many, many different uh, <laughs> items in the lexicon nowadays. Other of them might be totally single, but maybe want to be married. And just if you had as a, as a kind of final parting advice, any, anything that, cause, cause you're, you're a relatively young man without shouting out your age. I still consider myself relatively young and you are uh, <laughs> uh, who, who, who has uh, now been married. So relatively, I think even towards the trend of people getting married later in their thirties, you know, you're still in your twenties and, and getting married. So what, what kind of advice would you have for people who are considering it? But, but again, not just any old people, because we have some certain basic values that we would share the same when we focus on having a particular lens or worldview. Yeah. So I think the big thing, the biggest thing is for Debbie and I, we were on the same page because both of our goals was we want to honor God and glorify God. And if that means we go, we break up, then that was on the table throughout our relationship. Right. Um, but we believe through many things that God did in our lives and through the confirmation of the other people in our community that we believe we could serve his kingdom better as a unit um, in union than we could as single people. And I think that fundamental conviction of we are doing this for God, it makes all the other stuff sort of fall away. Um, I think it, it helps bring clarity when there's a lot of maybe society pointing you in one direction or like, you know, family expectations pointing you in another direction, whatever the thing may be, when your solid, like foundational core belief is we want to honor God, you know, that, that will help a lot. So in the relationship situation, I am by no means an expert, right? Just cause I got married does not make me, you know, uh, better than, or anything like that. First, I would say people should and have to understand that Singleness is a gift in scripture and it is not in any way deficient to be single. And if somebody is listening to, you know, even that question from a place of, well, I'm trying to get married so that I can, you know, you know, like that be better or have more respect or somehow like th that's not, I think the right way, like being comfortable with the, position that God has you in, I think is first and foremost important, right? Um, are you as an individual right now growing in your walk with God? Are you prioritizing him? Because it only gets more difficult to do so, right? As anyone is getting older, as more responsibilities increase due to work or other things that they're pursuing, um, being in a relationship is going to be more time consuming than not being in a relationship. And so steward your time wisely as an individual. Um, but talk regularly about God, make sure you're on the same page because there's a lot of people, like you said, who may self identify, but you recognize after being with them um, that, Oh, maybe God's taking you all in different directions. Y'all can both still be great people who love God and pursue him, but 
if somebody is feeling called to go in this direction and someone's feeling called to go in that direction, well, God is not a God of confusion, right? So like there is something that either someone's not pursuing what God actually wants them to do or God doesn't want them together, right? Um, so yeah, I, I, I guess I don't really know how to answer that question other than like seek God and seeking God looks like reading a scripture, praying, asking the community of believers around you, like what is their counsel? Um, and submitting yourself to that. I think for me, as my own example, when Debbie and I started dating, Deb, I was not open to it like a couple weeks before. So it's funny because like, like seriously, I had this arbitrary belief that I just did not want to date a student. So Debbie was still uh, finishing her undergrad at the time and I was not about it. I was just like, I have no desire to be interested in a student. So it's not even that I like considered her and said, no, it was just that I was like, I wasn't considering students. My you made your you made your own kind of category exactly, just, of judgment that this is not in God's plan for Eosias to be with a student. <laughs> I wouldn't even have said it wasn't in God's plan because I wouldn't have made that like leap. It just subconsciously had become this thing where I was like, oh, if someone's a student, it's going to take more time. Like, I'm not really trying to deal with, hey, babe, let's go out. No, I have to study for finals. Like, oh, uh, I was I tried to be a good student. I know that's a legitimate response. So I wasn't trying to deal with that kind of thing. But really it's funny because my roommate my roommate at the time um was friends with both of us and he was both in both our ears like hey y'all would be really good for each other y'all should see what this is about and i he he because he was someone that i respected and someone that i knew uh loved god i was like okay i'm gonna start praying about this and it started to be revealed to me like as i was praying like i had this arbitrary belief that wasn't grounded in scripture or anything that god had ever said it was just my personal desire. And if that's the case, then I need to allow God to do with that desire, whatever he pleases. And so for me, that looked like God, this is not something that I want, but whatever you want. Right. And one of the things that I realized was like, well, am I going to give my entire relationship future to God? Or am I going to try to hold on to my own desires of what this should be like? And that should be like, and, um, limit God to this certain category of uh, women. And over time, it just became revealed to me, like, yeah, the, the student thing is arbitrary. Like, you should feel comfortable going to ask around. I was like, okay, cool. And a couple of weeks later, you know, we went out and kept going out and prayed and prayed and prayed about it, really, because um, I just wanted to be sure, like, God, like, is this something that you want? And Debbie was praying about it regularly, like, Lord, if this is your will, make it clear to us. If it's not your will, make that clear to us. Um, and here we are. Now we're married. I got a ring on my finger. It's awesome. Tamas gan, tamas gan. Ba unet yau ante vet am tehut in dem mahone yau bzu hennen magan nat falgem gan unet am nagar birk ana hulem di hain nagar agyani mena. Banta Yemisara, Yabato Chachin, Yenato Chachin, Amlak, Xavier, Sumu Yparek, Yemesgana, Hinnen Gizehen, Selesa Wahaling, and Na, and the Bandianet Madrek, and then the Ganang, and then the Tayay, and Na, Mikir, and the Takafel, the name Bichasahon, the Tamil Kacho Chachin, and Nala Admacho Chachin. Hulu, Amasa Gnalo, no Hulem Anton Samasgen, Kanta Bestajerba, Misara Xavier and the Mamaskin and the Mitrada, Auk Allo, Tasfather Gallo. Amen, yeah. Kabula Suihun. Amen.